take our 401k, our retirement. Now they tell us we have no job. I mean, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas indeed. The short clip you just watched featured interviews with Enron's employees after the company started collapsing in 2001. And till today, it is the largest corporate fraud in the history of mankind that has since changed the life of its employees, investors and even had long-lasting impact on the way businesses are governed and regulated until today. Let me reinvest the profit. It's not a get-rich-quick scheme. 18 to 24 months, I'll put another $2 million in your pocket. Well, Australia's major banks are warning us all to be extra vigilant right now. Scammers are using mobile banking apps. This is actually totally fake. Oh no. Whether we like it or not, frauds and scams are an unfortunate reality in our world. When there's an abundance of wealth at stake, it only takes that one person with the power and desire to exploit it. And suddenly, poof! All the hard-earned money of thousands of people can vanish with the flick of the switch. So today, join me as we explore some of the most notorious and largest financial crimes in the US because knowing how not to lose your money is almost as equally important as making money. And if you know how the scams work, you are less likely to fall for one in the future. The most well-known financial scandal of this century is undoubtedly Enron and it even has a documentary dedicated to it. And at its peak in year 2000, the shares were worth as high as $90, making them one of Wall Street's darlings. And after all, they are the world's largest energy traders. Who wouldn't want to invest in them, right? So what did Enron do to become so successful? Well, it originated from a merger of two natural gas pipeline companies in 1986 led by the CEO, Kenneth Lay, and with the help of Jeffrey Skilling, who was initially a consultant from McKinsey and later Enron's CEO, the company transformed into an energy trading and supply giant. One of Enron's key innovations was the creation of a trading platform called the Enron Online, which earned them the title of of America's most innovative company by Fortune for six years in a row. The platform revolutionized energy trading by connecting energy producers with customers in real time, allowing fixed pricing through contracts and transforming the trading process from slow phone calls and faxes. And with its success, Enron expanded into other industries, employing more than 20,000 people and reaching a valuation of $90 billion at its height. But good times didn't last. Enron eventually faced increased competition and the company's profits dropped rapidly. So to maintain and drive up the share price, the company's executives started to be creative to hide the financial losses using mark-to-market MTM accounting to inflate assets value and earnings. And on top of that they also hit debts using special purpose vehicles SPV or aka shell companies led by the CFO Andrew Festo by moving assets that experience losses to the shell companies and inflating earnings by selling assets to the shell companies and buying it back at a higher price. But unfortunately, these deceptive practices couldn't be kept secret forever. In August 2001, the CEO Jeffrey Skilling resigned abruptly and analysts began to scrutinize Enron's finances, leading to a downgrade of the company's stock rate sending the share prices down and by October, Enron announced a $638 million loss and shortly thereafter, the Securities and Exchange Commission SEC, began investigating its transactions with the shell companies and in the end, the company filed for bankruptcy in December 2001 with shares plummeting to $0.26 cents per share. Basically, worthless and the CEO then received a 24 years prison sentence but was reduced to 14 years and this scandal led to new regulations such as the Sarbanes-Oxley Act 2002 which was created to improve the accuracy and reliability of financial reporting for publicly held companies. Up next, we have this man that executed the US or the world's largest Ponzi scheme ripping off as much as $65 billion from tens of thousands of people and this man is none other than Bernie made of a renowned and well-respected American financier and former chairman of Nasdaq in 1990. Bernie Madoff began his Wall Street career in the early 1960s as a penny stock trader and eventually formed Bernard L. Madoff Investment Securities LLC, which became one of the largest penny stock brokerages and wealth management firm. So much so that in the 1990s, his firm processed about 9% of all the trading orders for the New York Stock Exchange NYSE and using his reputation, 
Madoff attracted serious investors such as charities, hedge funds and even Hollywood stars to his wealth management fund, promising high returns. He was skilled at marketing his fund, creating a sense of exclusivity to attract new investors. He made you feel like you were the most charming person in the room. So sure enough, when I went down to interview him, he made me feel like I was the most intelligent, best informed reporter he'd ever met. But little did everyone know, he merely deposited their money into his personal bank account at Chase Manhattan Bank, now the JP Morgan Chase, instead of investing it in legitimate securities or assets. And how did he pay the earlier investors' return? Well, by using new investors' money, of course, the classic Ponzi scheme. And you might wonder why nobody ever noticed this scam, especially since his firm claimed to be making returns of 5.6% when the S&P 500 dropped 39% during the global economic downturn. This is too good to be true, right? Actually, Harry Marco Polos raised his suspicions to the US SEC repeatedly for 9 years but was ignored, and Madoff's scheme didn't collapse until the 2008 subprime mortgage crisis when he couldn't pay investors' withdrawal requests. And in the end, he confessed to his sons that he had been operating a Ponzi scheme for decades and he was then sentenced to 150 years in prison in 2009. A $4 billion Madoff victim fund, MVF, was then created to help compensate victims and another $14 billion was also recovered after the firm's liquidation, but this amount pales in comparison to the billions of dollars investors lost. And the SEC, which failed to detect Madoff's scheme despite multiple warnings, made changes to its enforcement policies, increased staffing and funding, while the US government implemented the Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act to increase transparency in the financial system. By the way, just a fun fact, do you know the term Ponzi is named after Charles Ponzi, an Italian immigrant who conducted the first ever Ponzi scheme back in 1920. He set up a company to gather money from investors to invest in the currency exchange scheme, promising 50% interest after 90 days. However, he used money from new investors to pay off old investors, similarly to the Madoff scheme. It eventually collapsed, following a newspaper article calling for an investigation and investors withdrawing their money which Ponzi himself couldn't return. And even after all these iconic historical fraud cases, people still won't learn. And just recently, there was another financial fraud involving the crypto exchange. And yes, I'm talking about FTX. So for those not familiar, don't worry, let me break this down for you. They were the world's leading digital cryptocurrency exchange, worth $32 billion at its peak, and was founded in 2018 by Sam Bankman fried also known as SBF. FTX is a platform for investors or traders to buy and sell their cryptocurrency online. As simple as that. But how did FTX stand out among all the exchanges? They grew quickly with the aggressive marketing strategy, hiring celebrities such as Tom Brady, Steph Curry from the NBA, Kevin O'Leary and even buying the rights to name Miami Heat Arena as FTX Arena for $135 million. FTX also created its own tokens, FTT, which allows traders to enjoy lower trading fees. They proved its strength when in late 2021, the price for cryptocurrency declined drastically, causing many platforms like Voyager and Celsius to shut down, while FTX still stood strong. However, in November 2022, an article published by Coindesk, a new site for crypto, on Alameda Research, a crypto trading firm also founded by SBF, sent FTX downhill. And the report revealed that Alameda's $14.6 billion assets as of the 30th of June were mostly FTT tokens totaling up to $5.8 million, exposing an unusually close relationship between both companies. And this posed a problem because FTT tokens are risky assets that cannot be easily exchanged for cash, sparking concerns on how Alameda Research and FTX would pay back their liabilities and capital. And what made it worse was Binance, the world's largest crypto exchange, decided to sell all their FTT holdings a few days later, significantly driving down FTT's value. And you can already guess the effect, right? The customers using FTX exchange started to worry and began withdrawing money as well. And the withdrawal request reached around $6 billion in just 72 hours. But little did everyone know that FTX used customers' deposits in their platform to fund Alameda too, and poof, customers' money 
vanish. FTX couldn't fork up that much amount of money to return to its customers in time, and although Binance tried to help FTX, they eventually backed out, raising concerns about how FTX handles customers' funds, and at the end of the day, FTX is left with no choice but to file for bankruptcy, leaving its customers uncertain whether they can recoup their money. And after this whole fiasco, SBF was arrested and charged with defrauding investors. The cryptocurrencies also took a hit and the SEC, along with other US regulators, may just seize this opportunity to step in for more scrutiny on crypto, which goes against the ethos of the creation of crypto on decentralization, where investors can manage their money without constant oversight. Next up, we have one of the largest financial crisis known as the Savings and Loan SNL crisis which occurred in the US during the 1980s to 1990s but is not frequently discussed. Savings and Loan Associations SNLs also known as the Thrift Institutions were originally created to promote home ownership and it functions similarly to banks where they accept deposits from customers and make loans to individuals and also small businesses. However, SNL focuses primarily on providing loans for residential purposes while commercial banks offer a broader range of financial services like loans to larger businesses, credit cards, investment services, etc. And over time, the lines between these two types of institutions blurred as SNLs expanded their services and commercial banks started mortgage lending. And before the crisis, SNLs were subject to different regulations and were primarily governed by the Federal Home Loan Bank Board FHLBB while the deposits of SNL were insured by Federal Savings and Loan Insurance Corporation FSLIC and later on replaced by the current Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation FDIC. So how did the crisis occur? It originated in the late 1970s when a combination of high inflation and soaring interest rates made it difficult for SNLs to earn profits on their long-term fixed rate loans and they struggled to compete with banks to offer higher interest rates on deposits and in response, the government decided to deregulate the SNL industry, allowing them to expand their lending and make riskier loans. And as a result of the deregulation, SNL industry assets grew 56% due to an influx of deposit thanks to the higher interest rates. However, the lack of oversight and the management's greed to achieve high returns led to a lot of speculative and unrealistic investments, particularly in commercial real estate. And when the real estate market crashed, many SNLs failed, which also led to the collapse of the FSLIC as their resources were insufficient to cover the extensive losses. And by 1989, more than a thousand SNLs had failed and the cost was enormous. And to address this crisis, the US government established the Resolution Trust Corporation RTC, to settle the failed SNLs and reimburse depositors. Ultimately, the US government was forced to spend over $160 billion on this crisis. Lastly, we have WorldCom. It was one of the most infamous scandals that happened in the 2000s, right after Enron. WorldCom was a major telecommunications company in the US during the 1990s, providing long-distance calling services and also internet access. It grew rapidly through numerous mergers and acquisitions, with the most high-profile one being the merger with MCI Communications back in 1998, which made WorldCom the second largest telco in the US. And at its peak, WorldCom's market cap reached a whopping $175 billion. But behind this growth, WorldCom's CEO, Bernard Abbas, and its CEO, FO, Scott Sullivan were manipulating the company's financial statements by overstating revenue by $3.8 billion and also improperly capitalizing expenses, creating a false image of profitability and financial wealth to attract investors and maintain its stock price. However, in June 2002, its internal auditors Cynthia Cooper and Jean Moss discovered the fraud and conducted investigations on their own. They contacted KPMG, the external auditors, as well as the audit committee at WorldCom. Ultimately, WorldCom filed for bankruptcy in July 2002 and by this time, the company owed its creditors as much as $7.7 billion. The company's CEO and CFO were then sentenced to 25 and 5 years in prison in 2005 respectively. And this also led to significant regulatory changes like the introduction of the Sarbanes-Oxley Act as mentioned in Enron's case earlier since both frauds happened one after another. Whew, I've just barely scratched the world of financial crimes. There are many, many more financial crimes in this world that you can ever imagine. Here's two more honorable mentions. I will start with the infamous Theranos case. 
Theranos was a blood testing startup in Silicon Valley that developed a revolutionary device called the Edison, which was designed to perform hundreds of tests on a single drop of blood from a finger prick, promising fast and accurate result. And that's a huge deal breaker to the medical industry. And at its peak, Theranos was once valued at $10 billion. However, in 2015, the Wall Street Journal published an article revealing that the Edison device was neither accurate nor reliable and that Theranos faked their data to make it appear as though the Edison was performing accurately. The rest is pretty much history. The company then collapsed and in 2022, its CEO, Elizabeth Holmes, was sentenced to more than 11 years in prison. Another honourable mention would be the infamous Wells Fargo scandal that shook the banking world. Wells Fargo, one of the largest banks in the US even today, was revealed to have created millions of unauthorized accounts in customers' names without their knowledge or consent. This scandal began when their bank employees was under pressure to meet sales targets and to hit bonuses, opened more than 2 million fake accounts and this resulted in customers being charged unnecessary fees and even suffering damage to their credit scores. And Wells Fargo was then hit with a $185 million fine and later agreed to a $3 billion settlement with federal prosecutors and the bank also dismissed more than 5,000 employees and the CEO, John Stump, resigned. This scandal then led to changes in sales practice and corporate culture at Wells Fargo Bank as the bank ended its aggressive sales targets and implemented initiatives to rebuild trust, allowing them to remain standing to this day. So the world of financial crime is huge and complex and sad to say, it's getting more sophisticated as time passes and it's hard for us outsiders to even know about it until after it happens. And if you stay until this point of the video, congratulations, you are well informed of the extreme greed and deception that can exist within the business world and hopefully that will give you a clearer picture on what to look out for in your investment journey. But perhaps most importantly, these cases remind us that while the pursuit for wealth and power may be an understandable goal for all of us, it should never come at the expense of our integrity as well as the trust of others because ultimately, the true value of our net worth lies not in the numbers on our bank accounts but in the principles and values that guide our decisions and actions. That's all from me now. Hope you enjoyed this video. It certainly was a joy for me to make it for you. Thank you for watching and I will see you in the next one.